ask you if you would stand one more time for the reading of the word today. Uh, last week, we were talking about uh, giving thanks always. Somebody say always. And as we ministered that thought, uh, that word out of Thessalonians said, when you give thanks in all things, not for all things, <laughs> that it's the will of God concerning you. And today I just want to tag that message. If you'll turn in your Bible to Romans 8, 28, probably was one of the last scriptures I used last Sunday. But as I begin to be ministered unto by the Holy Spirit, before our family came to our home yesterday evening, most of them do their Thanksgiving dinners on that day, Thursday, what have you. And then we have the leftovers <laughs> on Saturday. And what a great time we had all afternoon as they sanctioned our home with their presence. And we were able to celebrate them and pray for just the peace of God that's kept us all year long. Amen. But I believe today, out of Romans 8, 28, I want to tag that message with a thought today, finding God's purpose for your life. Say that with me. Finding God's purpose for your life. Amen. A lot of folks say, well, I don't know what my purpose is. Well, that's what I want to minister on today. Even when you're in tough times, God can lead you and guide you. Here we are. One scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter, or Romans rather, Romans 8, verse 28. And we know, somebody shout, we know that all things work together for good. Catch this to them that love God. Look at your neighbor and say, I love God. Come on. And then it says, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your blessings of life. And God, I'm asking you to touch us in a special way today. Father, those that have come to your house, they've come to seek refuge. I believe they're here because they honor you and love you. And they need new strength. And Father, we know new strength comes from your anointing and, and your word that feeds our soul. So Father, in the midst of all of this, we're praying that someone will be saved, healed, delivered by your grace, your mercy, your power. Touch those that are live streaming. Let them know we're praying for them. We reach out and we encourage them wherever they are that the best is yet to come. And we declare it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Turn to someone and say, I have purpose. Come on. In God. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Can we give God another praise for his word today? Amen. Well, we already know in reading this passage, the word purpose is mentioned in that last part of that verse. All things work together for the good of them that love God, uh, that are called according to his purpose, shall purpose. And I thought about people, as I mentioned a moment ago, who, who probably don't have a clue what their purpose is in life. As a young person, I know I faced that. And if you talk to some of my grandchildren who are attending college or already out of college or they're on a certain job at a hospital right now, uh, they're not in a profession necessarily, two of them are, but uh, there's one that's entertaining the thought of going through the medical uh, field of studying and I got to thinking about all that and within my heart I thought you know it's amazing how we have all said somewhere or sometime you know what is my purpose why am I here on this earth and and at the same time uh, we have to look at this word because uh, David said thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my pathway so I already know and I can tell a sinner if they'll just get in the word come on shout amen if they'll just get in the word of God God will lead them and give them wisdom am I right about it 
You know, it was the, the, the greatest or wisest man upon the earth, uh, David's son Solomon, who said, all is vanity. Now think about that. And uh, with that being said, you got to realize he had everything. He, he was a king. He, he, he was rich. He, he just had every, every desire uh, that a man could want. I believe even according to his testimony, he tried everything. He'd done everything. He possessed everything. He owned everything. And at the same time, his end conclusion was... All is vanity. What, what was he saying, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. He was in essence saying what you and I feel sometimes in our walk of life. Whereas it seems like we have a little money in the bank. We're driving somewhat an automobile, uh, if you will. We live in a house or we're renting, but the bills are being paid. And, and it, it almost is as if we got pretty good health. We're not worrying about dying. And but yet when we've experienced all of the food and all of this and uh, walk down this lane and that, I'm telling you right now, when you don't know and aren't fulfilling your purpose in life, then life seems like it is empty. Can I get an amen? I, I, I was turning the corner at Elmont, Texas just the other day, and I used that so others will know where I'm talking about. But God just put a flashback in my life personally and I begin to realize that you know 43 years ago that God allowed me to turn at that stop sign then not a caution light or red light as the day we we're moving up in Elmont come on we have a red light now but it was a stop sign back then I'll, I'll never forget I'd been saved only three weeks and or two and then I remember turning that corner headed to my wife's parents house and she lived out that way in her own home and I was going that direction and and at the same time it was as if I, I was trying to find my purpose in life I, I had already left the presence of God for five years and then it was grace somebody shout grace that allowed me to be found and restored. Your Bible says in the writings of Paul, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for we are saved by grace. Come on, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. You see, I believe that's the first step of finding your purpose. A sinner is lost. Can, do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, they are lost. But when you have someone who has been saved, then and they have a relationship with the Father. Come on. And the Bible said in Paul's writings, we're saved by grace through faith, not that of yourselves. Come on. You can't earn salvation. You can't buy eternal life. But I can declare to you, when you surrender your life to his hands, then God will raise you up and give you the purpose of a godly life. Give him praise right there because thank God for grace oh yes my life completely turned around from that moment of being saved and then I went on to begin to date the wife been with her 43 years and and God has has kept us he's provided for us but but we follow the word of God we had the relationship with God. And as we begin to work on the relationship, not just between ourselves, but ourselves and our Father, our Heavenly Father, then we did the vertical. Come on. We lifted up our hearts to Him. Then God worked out the horizontal. Are you with me today? So I, as I begin to think about that tears coming down my eyes, I, I just thought to myself, man, if you don't have purpose, the life Life is just worthless. I mean, you can you talk to a sinner that's drank whiskey all night long, or somebody who's been popping pills or doing dope or shooting crank in their arm, what have you. I'm gonna tell you right now, they they can't get a higher fix than being saved. Come on, shout amen. There's no greater high that lasts longer that is free. Come on, it's free, it's the grace of God is free. 
when you just say, yes, Lord. Amen. So Jesus always makes the difference. Well, when I thought about that, Jesus said no greater love. Watch me now. Because if, if you're going to find God's purpose and all things are going to work out for the good, he said to those who love God. And, and, and people can talk the talk, but they don't always walk the walk. Come on. Some of you ladies sitting out there, you had a young man tell you, oh, I'm in love with you. Come on. But you didn't believe that hog works. Come on. You knew a fake when you saw one. Can I get the women to just say yes on that? Amen. So you didn't even pay them any attention. And so, but you know, but when, when God connected you to the right person, I, I, I can't explain it. I told the, 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 our family yesterday, our, our, our nephews, or rather all the children and the grandchildren and the great grandchildren, I was telling them how God placed me in, in my purpose and with the grace that fell upon my life. Uh, even though I had to make a choice to receive it, Amen. I'm so glad that he had mercy on me and he brought me back into the fold. Amen. The word said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, we should represent the life of Christ, but we sometimes come up short. Has anybody here today ever felt like you came up short? Come on. But isn't the good news that when we came up short, we begin to repent and call on his name and it seems like that heaven opened and the anointing of his presence fell upon you and upon me tears come down your eyes and you know that he's still your redeemer I don't know about you but I'm glad that I have a redeemer today that saved me come on now he raised me he restored me he took a life with no end and he gave me a future he gave me a hope and you know what a America needs today. Do you know what your sons and daughters need today? They need to have hope. Uh, not in the banker. Not what the lawyer says. Uh, not what the doctor says necessarily. But we need to have a word from God that will give us a living hope that it's going to get better. This isn't all there is. We just got to believe that he's still in our midst. Uh, he's going to show up and he's going to show out. Give him glory and praise in the house. You see, I might not get excited about the Dallas Cowboys losing another game and Baylor barely pulled one out yesterday and that was all right. But I'm telling you, you ought to look at somebody right now and say, you're on the winning team. Come on. And that is the family of God. So Jesus said these words, No greater love than this that a man will lay down his life for another. That's what Jesus did for you and I over 2,000 years ago on the cross. And then I reminded of what he also said. Because if I'm going to find my purpose in life, a godly life, then I know I just can't love God only, but I also got to honor him. And he said these words, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Pastor, what's that mean? That means if I continue to be a selfish person and I don't want to do what God's calling me to do, I got people sitting here today watching live stream. They say, well, I must be exempt because I'm not a preacher. Wrong. You, when you got saved, the Bible said, and I think it'd be good if you turned right there right now. Turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and look at that scripture I quoted you a moment ago. And then it reads on to tell you that you're a workman. In other words, God didn't call you and I to just get saved and, and he would let us sit in his presence no he's going to have someone who's up and about the father's business and here's what your bible says verse 8 of chapter 2 ephesians grace by grace you're saved through faith not that of yourselves not of works lest any man should boast but look at verse 10 for we somebody shall we 
are his workmanship. In other words, we're his creation. Created in Christ. What's that? Created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in your time past, Gentiles in the flesh who called who are called uncircumcision, uncircumcision. Look at verse 12. That at that time ye were without Christ. We can all relate to that. We were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth or the blessings of God. Verse goes on to say of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Watch this. Having no hope. How many remembers when you didn't have hope? Amen. Having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, though, is a blessing to hear. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. As a matter of fact, your Bible said that God saved us and he's raised us and he's allowed us to be raised up and to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why don't we give him one more praise right there? That's what he done for us. Now, what does that mean? That means that we're not beggars. That means we're not uh, aliens from the blessings of God. That means we're not discounted or kicked to the curb. That, that we're uh, illegitimate children. There is no such thing as a mistake when it comes to birth. God ordained our birth. God ordained our future. All we have to do is hunger for his presence. And he'll lead us and guide us. And I'm telling you right now, there's no greater life than living the life of a Christian. You can live any other lifestyle you want to, but you'll never be more fulfilled and more happier and more content than living a life for God. All shout amen. I know I'm telling you the truth. So, so I understand that if I'm selfish, I'm going to lose my life of purpose. Sister Ollie, there's people that God has positioned on this planet to be singers and worshipers. Though the Bible said all of the generation of God has been created to praise the Lord. Many of us just make a noise, but there are some good noises to hear. Come on. And, and they're special people with special talent. Uh, the, the musicians are the same. Then God has teachers and preachers and prayer warriors. Well, what about those working in the trenches and behind the scenes? You see, God always has a purpose for every life. Okay, I'm taking you to a story that many of you are familiar with, the book of Ruth. It's on page 405 in my King James Bible. In that story, God continually, I don't know what it is, but he'll put a name in my spirit. <laughs> right after today, I'll, it might be Monday, but I, God's going to just speak a word to me. And that's what he even did in the life of Naomi and Ruth. You know, Naomi was the mother-in-law and Ruth was her daughter-in-law. Many of you know this story. Uh, in chapter 1, uh, we find out that Ruth, this story in chapter 1, speaks of loss. Uh, Naomi, uh, being married to Amalek, was living in Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. Say that with me, house of bread. In other words, a place where God feeds his people. How many is glad you're sitting in the house of God instead of on the street corner this morning? I mean, you know, God provides a place for his children to come together. I know we have a home that we'll go to after service, but thank God we have a place to come and all of us can meet together and, and begin to rejoice and be thankful to God for what he's done. But anyway, chapter one talks about the loss of a husband. After 10 years of leaving the house of bread, Bethlehem, Brother Pete, they left because... The man of the house said there's a famine, which there was, and things were bad, and money was tight, and they decided to go down to a place called Moab. 
Now the word Moab is important. Bethlehem means house of bread, God's house. But then again, the land of Moab meant to settle. Uh, and the word said they went there just to sojourn. They didn't plan on staying there long. But how many know some people who left the house of God and they were going to come back, but they never made it back? And it's the same way when you walk in the direction of sin. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. And the writer said it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And trust me here, it'll always cost you. Come on now. More than you want to pay. It'll rob you of your health. It'll rob you of your spouse if you're married. It'll rob you of a family of children. Come on now. It'll cause you to maybe walk away from a good paying job. Sin always destroys. Sin always will, will mark the life that God has blessed you with. That's why it's always important to walk with God. Amen. And to stay in his will. So in this ch chapter one, they go there, they dwell 10 years. All of a sudden, Amalek dies, uh, her husband, Naomi's husband. Then she has two sons that are married to two daughter-in-laws and both of them die. It's amazing in a 10 year period, what can happen? I don't know why they died. I don't know what the circumstance was, but normally you don't lose a dad and two sons in a family in that short a time. And all of a sudden, chapter one tells us after the loss of a husband, the loss of a daughter-in-law, both those daughter-in-laws had a choice to make. And it was Orpha who decided she would go back to her paganistic dwelling and lifestyle where she came from. In other words, undoubtedly she didn't know the God that Naomi served like Ruth did. Somehow Ruth connected to this woman, her mother-in-law, Naomi. Now I know mother-in-laws are not always the favorite to some, but I want to say right here on the live screen, I have the best mother-in-law. Come on somebody. And, 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 and that's going to get me another chocolate cake. All right. So I'm just telling you that, that this woman, Naomi, her name meant pleasant. Think about that. Uh, isn't it good to be around people who are pleasant? Come on. I mean, have you ever been around somebody who was bitter? Come on. Who was angry all the time? Who, who just, I mean, they just seemed to fill the room with, with just darkness, if you would. And, and, uh, but, but anyway, Naomi's name meant pleasant. And, and don't forget, she has taken this journey with her husband and her two sons. Now they're married two of the daughters of Moab and, and they're in the land of settling. Oh, I want to encourage somebody today. Never get settled in this world. Come on. I said never get settled in this world. As a matter of fact, Hebrews tells us that we're as the pilgrims of faith. We're just passing by. Come on now. One of these days, the trump of God's going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. You know, we live right near within a half mile of a graveyard. My father-in-law is, is buried there and his brothers are buried there. And I know where my mother's buried, but one of these days when that trump sounds, whether you believe it or not, God said the graves are going to open. Come on. All the loved ones that have been saved in the faith, they're going to rise. Are you hearing me? They're coming up with a glorified body. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there won't be no more back pain. There won't be no bad knees. Everything's going to be transformed. Are you hearing me? Won't be no popping pills, but I'm telling you, when they get up, that lets me know it's my time to rise. Because the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive, we which are saved, we which are ready looking and praying for his return we're going to meet the Lord in the air come on somebody we're going up on the first trump it gives me hope 
to know that I don't have to worry about this world. I have a job to do. You have a job and a purpose, and that's to be the workman that God's called you to do. He gave you a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, if he found you, it's your turn to turn to someone who's lost without Christ and tell them of his goodness and his mercy and just invite them to the house of God. You might not get them saved where they're at but all you got to do is live the life raise your hand and shout amen oh hallelujah finding God's purpose man I hope you don't leave here today without knowing the purpose of God well chapter one when those family members died it ends up with only two people Naomi and Ruth and you can feel their pain. There has to be more than myself in this room today that has experienced losing a loved one. Can I see a hand? You've lost a loved one. And when that takes place, there's mourning. I can't help but see the, the, the face of Naomi as she has wept and went through sorrow over her husband passing in a strange land they're not where god wanted them to be but they they settled there and then she loses one son on top of that there's more pain come on now i almost feel like her thoughts could have been my lord what can happen to me more have you ever been in that road where you thought everything's going wrong and you said to yourself what else can happen come on and all of a sudden, she loses another son. Well, I would think you would about be ready to give up. It looked like hope was all gone. And it's as if she's wanting to say, do I want to take a risk in losing again? Come on. Sometimes I've known of some people who uh, lose a boyfriend or a husband or what have you, or they're dating, and, and they're, they're, they try to start saying, well, I can't make it by myself, uh, and they forget about God. Come on. Uh, now, just work with me here. And they start, uh, they start looking for a hookup. Are you hearing me now? And, and I just want to encourage all the women of God here today, especially if you're single or you come through a divorce, you don't need need to take hold of the first thing that walks in your pathway on two legs come on now uh, because uh, you got to see what God says if you wait on the Lord come on God's going to renew your strength are you hearing me you're going to mount up with wings as an eagle you're going to run and not be weary who am I talking to but you got to realize that Boaz in this story comes out in chapter 2 and, and the word tells us he was their redeemer are you hearing me and, and Naomi and Ruth both need a redeemer after chapter one they return back to Bethlehem and it's there they still don't have nothing but God was working behind the scenes uh, how many knows God's working in the midst of your trouble so realize ladies right now don't take the first thing that comes by you need to wait and trust God to provide for you uh, and, 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 and let me let me look at Boaz Boaz the Bible said he was a wealthy man that's right he was a rich man listen listen he was a faithful man he was a strong man he was a wise man and that creates a husband come on and if you'll wait on that you don't need a you don't need come on you don't need a bozo you need a boaz are you hearing me And you don't need to get connected to his family cousins either. First one was named Broke Ass. Come on. Here's one. Cheap Ass. Look at your neighbor and say, I dated him. Come on. Lazy Ass. <laughs> he was Dumb Ass. And I'm going to stop right there. Okay. Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor is a mess this morning. Come on. He ate too much turkey. Come on. Well, 
so chapter one talks about the loss. But chapter two brings us to the time where even though they're back in Bethlehem, they're still broke and they're broken. They're returning from a troubled life. There's been nothing but chaos. Now you've got to see that because all of us have been in that position before. At least I have. I've been down to nothing. That's why when I took that turn at that Elmont stop sign the other day, my life flashed back in front of me. And God began to let me know, son, it was my grace. Come on. <laughs> it was my mercy that brought you back home. Oh, hallelujah. You say, is that possible? Well, the prodigal son found purpose. Come on. He took everything. He spent everything, wound up in the pig pen. But one day, God, I said, God, he gave him back his right mind. And the word said when he came to himself, he arose and went back to the father's house. And when he got back to the father's house, how many knows there's no place like home? Come on. When he got to the father's house, I wish I could encourage somebody. You you're in the right place this morning. You're in the right time of a season of blessings. Because when you're in the Father's house, he's going to restore you. He's going to heal you. He's going to deliver you. He's going to raise you up. He said, you're the head. You're not the tail. You're above. You're not beneath. I'm going to bless you in the city. Who am I talking to? I'm going to bless you in the field. I'm going to bless you and I'm going to take you further than you've ever known. Give him praise in the house. Hallelujah. The woman at the well found purpose. <laughs> she had done hooked up with five other men in her life. Somebody sang that country song. Looking for love in all the wrong places. Then somebody else came along and said, all my exes live in Texas. Well, I'm not here to remind you of your old school song. I just want to remind you of this one. We'll know as it goes because better and better is just ahead. Come on. I'm telling you, God has an amazing grace for your life when you season it with the presence of God. So in chapter 2, she comes back to the city. She walks in all disturbed. It's almost as if she has no future and no hope. But look at chapter 2. Let's go there right now. Chapter 2, the Bible tells us, and Naomi, verse 1, had a kinsman of her husband. This is Ruth chapter 2 verse 1. And the Bible said he was a mighty man of wealth. Of the family of Amalek and his name was Boaz. The word Boaz means redeemer. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi. Now they got back to town. They were living probably in a shack. I don't know. It wasn't a castle. Trust me. They didn't have much. Two women took a journey back to Naomi's hometown. And the reason they did was because she heard that the Lord was blessing them again. Come on. How many knows if you'll just stay where God plants you, he's got greater things on the way. Don't be discouraged this morning. Be encouraged, church. And then the Bible said that she told her mother-in-law, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn. Well, I began to look at that, and it also tells me, and she said, in, after him in whose sight I shall find grace, shout grace. And she said unto her, Naomi said, uh, go my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers and her hap, or her happenstance, or she just happened to light up on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred 
of Amalek. Can I stop there just for a moment and tell you nothing just happens? Come on. Think about it. I don't care how much money you're trying to bet on the lottery. Uh, you hadn't got that kind of luck. And if you had what the world calls luck, instead of hope in the God we serve, uh, you would realize that everything you try to luck out in life is less than a 50-50 chance. I mean, they have statistics up into the thousands when people are able to win the lottery. And most of them, when they win it, they become a loser because they spend it on themselves and in their greedy moment. But let me tell you something. You cannot have no money in the bank, not have a job, not even have an automobile and still have Jesus in your life and you'll be the happiest person on the planet. But his purpose is not to have you in a broke state. As a matter of fact, he wants to bless you so much that other people will wonder, how are you so blessed in the midst of a famine? How are you so blessed when everybody has lost their job? I'll tell you how. He's still my provider. Come on now. Boaz, the Redeemer, is the type of Christ. Christ is our provider. Come on. The word said, my God, Philippians, my God, shout he's my God. He shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Do you realize the Bible didn't say that heaven was broke? Come on. As a matter of fact, there's more stuff up there than you could ever imagine. God wants to get his stuff to your house. Come on now. All you got to do is honor him and trust him and obey him. And I'm telling you, obedience will produce a reward in your life called blessings. Amen. So nothing just happens. There's no such thing as luck because all of it takes place through the grace of God. The Bible said all good and perfect things come from above. So the Bible said she goes, goes into the field and just happens by the grace of God to be in that field of Boaz. And I love this part because the Bible said that Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers that were in the field, he said, the Lord be with you. Man, that's powerful. Ruth was already in the field. It's amazing how God led her to the field of her Redeemer. Come on. <laughs> how many believes God has led you where you're at? Come on. The devil didn't lead you. God led you. And the footsteps of a righteous are ordered of the Lord. Another passage says the, right, the footsteps of a righteous are led. God will lead you. Not just by his word, but by his spirit. Am I right about it? They that are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. Hallelujah. Male and female. So Boaz, he comes into the field and he sees Ruth out there. She's on the outside corners of the field. The reapers, the men are in the middle. They're taking the harvest by storm. And they're working for Boaz, the owner. But there's Ruth, and according to the law of the, of, of, of the Old Testament, that there were what they called gleaners. N not just the reapers, but gleaners. And, and the reapers were to leave a certain portion of the harvest in the corners of the field. But Boaz comes out, and the first thing that happens and catches his eye is a good-looking woman. Come on. He sees Ruth, and he goes over to the head foreman that he had working, and he said, <sighs> uh, who is that? Who's that? Who's that lady? Pretty lady, gleaning in my field." And all of a 
of a sudden, she not only got his attention, but he said to the reapers, he said, I tell you what, he said, uh, she looks mighty fine to me. Come on. And, and he said, I want you to leave her a blessing. Uh, he, he, he heard from his head man, she's that daughter-in-law of the woman Naomi who just returned to town. You, she had lost her husband. You, you know, he said, oh yeah, oh yeah. And he said, uh, she came to me and said, can I just glean in your field? <laughs> And I want to tell you right now, Boaz, she's, she hasn't been staying in the house. You, you, need, to, you need to mark this down. She, she's been working. Somebody say working. She's been working in the field. Oh, I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but God loves workers. Come on, raise your hand. Some of y'all working jobs and providing, I'm telling you, there's a blessing coming your way. But, but, but he, he understands everything, and he says, uh, I'll tell you what to do. Uh, he goes to her, and he says to Ruth, he, he says, Daughter, I, I want to tell you something. Uh, seven things that he began to tell her. He said, number one, I think you ought to stay in my field. Come on. Don't go to another field. Stay right here. Can, can I encourage somebody today? Don't leave the house of God. Stay right where God puts you. Come on. Because if God planted you here, he's going to bloom you here. God has a purpose of your life to be able to do greater things than you could ever imagine. But I'm, I'm telling somebody right now that, that Boaz told this woman, said, the first thing you need to do is hear what I'm about to say to you. And that's important today because he said, uh, while you're listening to me, don't go into another field and don't go from this place. Abide right here. Somebody say right here. Now, it's one thing to hear with the natural ear, but it's another thing to understand. A lot of people, I've been told, don't hear very much. As a matter of fact, I've been told in a marriage of 43 years, you're not listening to me. Come on. Someone said men, husbands have selective hearing. But I want you to know right now, they, they can get better. Come on, say amen, women. They can get better. So usually someone who listens, amen, is going to obtain greater knowledge. But you have to move from listening or hearing what you hear to understanding what you hear. Uh, as a matter of fact, Romans 10, 7 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But then God tells us in the book of James, be not hearers only, but doers of the word. Uh, you know, uh, this woman, uh, Ruth was a worker. She was busy in the field. And, and, and Boaz recognized that. And when he began to talk to her, he said, daughter, he said, I already know who you are. And I, I know what you've done. It's already been revealed to me. You know, somebody must have told him the story. How you, how you lost your husband, but yet you left your family, your father, your mother, the place of thy nativity, and you came to take care of your mother-in-law all the way back to a land and to a people you don't even know. And he said, you're going to be rewarded for that. Everything's going to be taken care of. Well, many of you know the story. You see, the harvest is in the field. The field is the world. And you and I are the laborers of the harvest. Matthew's gospel declares the words of Jesus, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers 
into the field. God has us at a set time, at the right time, at the right place. And if you and I are ever going to win souls for God, it's in the day and hour we live, especially when people are depressed and they don't have hope. You are the light that dispels the greatest darkness. And because of the light that's of the church, we're a city set on a hill that can't be hid. Come on, give God praise. He told her, linger as long as you can in this field. Don't go anywhere else. Stay in the field. Don't get frustrated. Some people get frustrated working for God and they quit. You don't need to do that. That's the trick of the enemy to get you out of position. Come on. Don't let the enemy steal your position. You know, as I look more into this this story, I understand, as she kept listening to this man, she returned back home and told her mother-in-law, said, I went into this field. And when she heard it, she said, that's nothing but Boaz. He's, he's our kinsman. And the Bible said it was the next morning after she had slept at his feet that he covered her according to the custom of the law. And he went forth to the gates and 10 men were brought there to judge, I believe, the sale of the property that he redeemed back. And the Bible said that Boaz became the redeemer for this woman, Naomi and Ruth. And if you'll study this story out in your time to come, you'll find out that the Bible said not only did she become redeemed unto the Lord as to speak, but she also fell in to the lintage of the birth of Christ because when her and Boaz became husband and wife, she produced a son by the grace of God named Obed. Come on, say amen. And I'm telling you right now that God had a purpose for Ruth's life, and he still had a purpose for Naomi. What can you say about it, preacher? No matter what you're going through or been through or standing in the midst of, there's still hope beyond the scope, and God is going to continue to make a way before you where there seemeth no way. Oh, yes. You need to be aware of people that are speaking in your life. Don't listen to anybody. Don't get a word from anybody, but get a word, Brother Roy, from the God you serve. John 8, 32 said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Boaz told that woman, Not only don't you not leave this field uh, and stay close to my handmaidens. In other words, don't forsake the house of God. Come on. The word tells us, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some, but encourage one another so much the more as the day of his coming. Come on. So I understand. He said, you need to latch on the right people. There's wrong people that'll come in your life to destroy you, but there's right people that'll make a difference and they'll help you in your walk of faith. Shout amen. Man. Oh, yes, Psalms 133 said that David declared, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Somebody say, Man, refuse to settle in Moab. If I could tell anybody that today, don't settle for just the things of this world or for a spirit of lethargy in the body of Christ, but be up and about God's work of ministry. Stand with me all over the house today. Hallelujah. God speaks about service. Let me leave you with this, I believe, a word that should allow you to become what God wants you to be and find your purpose. When you're waiting on your blessing, Maybe blessings haven't overtaken you as much lately. Find someone to serve. Come on. 
In other words, do good to someone that's in need. I have found that out all my life. When blessings wasn't flowing in my life, I started giving blessings away. Come on. And when I started helping others and blessing others, God started blessing me. Come on, give him praise in the house. Protect your name. I believe Boaz, the Redeemer, a type of Christ, was telling her, don't go out in the other fields of this world. Young people, hear me. Stay in the field of God. Stay in the things of God. Because Proverbs tells us, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Mm. He told her, let your eyes be on this field. Are you hearing me? God was telling her through Boaz, keep your eyes on this field, the field of the harvest. Don't let your eyes wander away from the purpose of God in your life. Because if you ever lose the purpose of God in your life, listen to me, you've lost everything. Nothing you have will replace the purpose of God. That's what God's been speaking to me. And the Bible said in those last verses, and when Ruth was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves, the big harvest, and reproach her not. And I love this part. Let fall from some of y'all handfuls on purpose. Handfuls on purpose. God used Boaz and those reapers to leave Ruth blessings upon blessings in the field of harvest where she was reaping. You see, one of these days, everything's going to be over. That's why your Bible says, work while it is day, for the night cometh when no man shall work. I'm shutting my Bible for the purpose to tell you this. I've seen a lot in 66 years, been a few places, and I've never had more peace of mind, more fulfillment in my life than living for God and working for God. When I was young, I said, I don't want to be a preacher. I don't want to be in church all the time. But it was the greatest decision that I ever made. And it would have never happened without people praying. And here's what I want to do today. I want you to just grab someone by the hand. And it's my job as a pastor this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want you to meditate for the moment on the Spirit of God that I believe has spoken a word to you today. You cannot make the decision for someone standing next to you. Every person here has to make a decision for themselves. That first decision is to surrender your life totally to Jesus Christ, who loves you more than you could ever imagine. He wants the best for you. You know the enemy has already tried to destroy you several times. And God keeps knocking on the door of your heart, saying, if you'll turn to me, you're going to have purpose for your life. And when you walk in that purpose that God's destined for you, life is going to unfold before you step by step according to God's will. But if you're under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to surrender to Him, you want His will for your life, you want to find God's purpose for living, because you know what you've already tried, 
never satisfies. Would you slip that hand up right now and say, Pastor, I need prayer. Come on, somebody in the building, there's a hand. Someone else. God speaking to hearts this morning. Okay. I believe God has told us that everything is said at the master's table. So here's what I want us to do. Grab someone you have a hand connected to. Bring them to the front. I want to pray a special blessing over every family, over every individual. Come on, as we gather right here at the front, we're going to pray this prayer. They're coming right now. I believe that God's about to open a door. He said, I will set an open door before thee, and no man shall shut it. And if you want to be in the center of God's will and in the purpose of your life, this is the greatest decision that you'll ever make. It can be a decision of recommitment. Let's bow heads and pray. Heavenly Father, right now I just ask for the Holy Spirit to touch our hearts right now.